Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Professor Barrera for uh, inviting me. It's been over 10 years since I last gave a talk here at Rice, and uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here. I appreciate you all coming here. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to say that to you all. <laughs> to <my field>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, overview of my talk is going to include a uh, brief introduction to the company, Perpetual Technologies, also to the uh, thermal spray technology. I'm going to talk to you also about the uh, Office of Naval Research Program. They're the ones who first started uh, all these efforts on nanostructure thermal spray coating. I'm going to then move on to proven applications, specifically on ceramic coatings uh, for military as well as industrial use. And I'm going to talk about one promising application on nanostructured metal coatings. And specifically, it's on nanostructured end crawlies or bond coats on uh, thermal barrier coatings. And I'm going to summarize my talk and just go acknowledge the contributors. You want to check that light? You want to see if we do like that better? Okay, that one? This one? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, just a general overview of what we do, or I say we, because I want everyone to think we're a big company, but it's only me in my at my house on a computer. That's perpetual technology. Uh, we, we currently offer consulting services relating to conventional as well as nanostructured thermal spray coatings. Some of the accomplishments so we've developed the first non-military application for thermal spray nanostructured coatings. And uh, my two collaborators for that, pleased to say that they're here at this talk. And that revolves around the titanium dioxide coating, and I'll talk about that a little later. I uh, currently have three patents related to thermal spray nanostructured coatings and working on uh, co-developing an economical processing rep for producing nanostructured metal powders. I'm going to just go quickly through this. Uh, basically, uh, clients and collaborators over the last 10 years, um, I'm going to start off by saying that Rice University was my very first client. I thank Rick for that. Uh, but uh, over the years, we've uh, gotten contracts from large companies, GE, Exxon Mobil, uh, worked with the military, mostly with the Navy, through ONR, or Naval Surface Warfare Center, the Naval Academy, and recently been collaborating with the Army Research Lab. Uh, also doing work with other universities, and uh, special mention for F.W. Gardner and Mogus Industries, they were the uh, first industrial company located right here in Houston that uh, actually gave me a fairly large contract and we've been working together since. So this is a real brief general uh, description of thermal spray process. It's by far the most versatile modern surfacing method with regard to economics, <coughs> range of materials, and the uh, scope of applications. You start off with your feedstock material generally in uh, either powder form, wire form, and now recently uh, introduced solution form. And then you have your energy source, which can be derived from electricity or from combustible gas. You introduce your feedstock material in there, you melt your feedstock material, and accelerate your molten droplets onto a surface where upon impact it undergoes fast quench and forms this lamellar structure. This is a simple schematic of the cross-sectional view. So this region is your coating. And uh, in a lot of cases, there, it's not very homogeneous, but it serves its purpose very well for many applications. Some of the advantages of thermal spray includes the ability to apply coatings of any material that has a stable molten phase. Okay, that includes metals, ceramics, polymers, as well as their composites. You can also use them to provide wear, corrosion, and thermal protection for most metal-based met uh, uh, base substrates, as well as to, you can do so uh, with uh, minimal thermal effect. So unlike welding where you have the heat affected zone, you avoid that. These are uh, just an example of a few thermal spray processes, common ones. This is uh, flame spray, twin wire arc spray, they're typically handheld torches. You can use them for fairly low-cost applications, large surface areas. Uh, common 
uh, materials that you can apply coatings with are aluminum, zinc, magnesium uh, for corrosion protection, cathodic protection. And then you have this, it stands for a high velocity oxy fuel. And it's really catered uh, with this uh, high velocity and relatively low temperature. It's really a, a good way to apply uh, temperature sensitive materials such as carbides, tungsten carbide cobalt, uh, as well as metals that you want to mitigate or minimize oxidation. And you have air plasma spray systems that are uh, conducive for high temperature applications, so high melting temperature materials such as ceramics, as well as uh, refractory metals. Now, the uh, whole concept of uh, thermal spraying balanced spectral coatings was first initiated by Dr. Uh, Lawrence Kavikov, uh, who is a program officer at the Office of Naval Research. And uh, he initiated this program in 1996. Typically, ONR programs are three-year programs. However, due to the success that I'm going to mention in the following slides, they extended it for two additional years. The mandate uh, that uh, Dr. Kavikov gave to to uh, the, the people who received funding was that he wanted development in materials not in the, the spray process. He didn't want anyone to you know, build a new spray system specifically for this. He wanted you to use depot available commercial thermal spray processes. And the main goal, the, the push towards this type of uh, improvement in coatings this shown here, this is Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. It's a beautiful uh, location. Uh, in fiscal year 2003, you can see just their maintenance cost for their fleet was $10 billion. So there's a lot of room. If you improve on protective coatings, you can really shave a lot of money off this. So that's, that was a huge uh, push towards this program. Now, the term nanostructured in this case is described uh, as any material which has some physical feature uh, less than 100 nanometers in size. And the two types of structures that were focused on within a, a Navy program was to have nanoparticles in a matrix of material. And then also you could have nanocrystalline uh, coatings. And the, the reason for these two relate to these two, two common wear-resistant materials. You have tungsten carbide cobalt, as well as alumina titanium. And here you see these are the, the, the surface views after a scratch test. On the left is your conventional material of that, those compositions, and here's the nanostructure. And the two key features that you, you can see is that the nanostructure, the scar left behind after the scratch test with the nanostructure samples, they width and the depth actually are narrow, uh, narrower and shallower, which means this material is harder. It resists the penetration of tires. As well, if you look carefully, you have these cracks that run perpendicular to the direction of your scars. For this material as well as here, if you look carefully, there are many cracks there. Here, with the nanostructure samples, you see there's no cracks at all. In fact, the debris from these, uh, the scratch, uh, as well as the surface, looks more like a ductile material, it's not a ceramic or, or hard material. So that's something very unique. You have something that's definitely harder, yet it looks tougher. And those don't go hand in hand in conventional materials. Usually you get high hardness, you compromise by getting more uh, brittle material. So the goal is, can you then take this feature, characteristics, introduce it into a coating form uh, to, to protect your component? 